Hi guys, it's Dovinik here and today is probably the most serious video that I'm going to do. It's not a stream or about a game. Um, today I wanted to talk about anxiety a little bit, um, mostly because of noticing on my Facebook and probably all social media um, about people re really struggling with things like this, um, anxiety, depression. And it felt like to me that it's becoming more, whether it's, whether it is becoming more sort of, um, more suffered with now than ever, or that people are just talking about it more, I don't know. But I thought that it would make a good video for people, um, if I talked about my own experiences with anxiety. Um, a lot of you that know me from Facebook or in, in real life, well know that I have struggled with this all my life. Uh, it's not a recent thing. In fact, I'm probably better now than I ever have. And um, I've, uh, maybe another video of this will just add to the voices that are already there of people sort of saying, you know, this is happening to me as well. So you're not alone. Um, I haven't structured this in any way. So you'll have to apologize if I, if I ramble on. Those of you that join me on Twitch will know will be used to that by now anyway. And I'm sorry about my overly squeaky chair. I'm using a microphone so you can probably hear it pretty loud. But yeah, uh, I'll start, I think, with just explaining a little bit about me and, and my anxiety before we get into sort of um, the thicker bits. Uh, I started suffering with this. I'd, it's hard to, to, to narrow it down, but I started to notice that it was, I was more anxious than most people in my sort of pre-teens. Um, I had this sort of overwhelming thing where I, I um, overanalyzed every situation, even, even as so young, sort of carried the world on my shoulders, if you will. Um, everything I did, I, I what if about, what if this happens, what if that happens. Um, I, I remember being about, I must have been less than eight when I when I was told that when your heart stops you die. Everybody knows that. But so sort of this struck me and I remember the exact I was outside my front door when I realised this and I sort of started holding my pulse and like I can't feel it. I can't feel it. Does that mean I'm dead? And I, it freaked me out. And this went on for days and days and days of sort of checking. I wasn't getting the right place um to feel my pulse. But I was just asking everybody all the time about it and uh, that was when I first noticed that I, I started getting anxious about things and then teachers would tell stories of schools that be careful around glass because they knew um, somebody with it in their eyes or you know the, to the, the, the stories that teachers tell to children to stop them from doing things. These hit me really hard, really hard and I worried about them all the time. I'm still scared of glass now because of that, that story. <laughs> Um, and this carried on and got worse and then obviously your teen years are hard anyway and, and a lot of people will struggle with anxiety then just just because the hormones and it got it got considerably worse for me now it didn't help that my mother also has anxiety oh well, she's passed now sorry but um she had really 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 bad undiagnosed anxiety um, and I lived with her till I was 25 and we sort of bounced off each other with it. I picked up her, what I like to call the what if syndrome, um, which is whenever I did anything, she would say, oh, what if this happens? What if that happens? Um, and it wasn't your sort of normal level what ifs. It was really daft sort of extravagant things to worry about. So like, what if you go into town and you get mugged or you catch the wrong bus home and end up in some horrible neighborhood uh, some weirdo gets hold of you. Do you know what I mean? Just really, really um, horrible what ifs. And it's not because she was trying to scare me. It's because these were the these were the thoughts that were going through her head. So I, after years and years of that, I sort of didn't want to leave the house, and we sort of stayed together, being anxious, and that's all we did. Me and my mum. And when you're a teenager and all your friends want to go out and and do things, and I I was more worried about the effect it would have on my mum um, doing sort of normal things. When it when I got to about 15, I eventually stopped. My, my friends went their way and I stayed in. And as I got to 16, I didn't have any friends because, you know, they wanted to carry on doing fun things and I, I couldn't do it. I, I did I did do a little, do you know what I mean? I did your sort of normal 
level uh going out and, and getting and getting beer and hanging around my friends after night but it had such a horrible effect on my mom uh that I, I just didn't do it and then after a while of, of um seeing somebody else scared for you all the time you become scared yourself yeah I, I picked up the what ifs on my own um and, and it got to the point where I didn't leave my village on my own until I was 19 20 I'd not even been on a bus on my own till I was 20 uh, and it was the most horrifically uh, terrifying experience for me doing that. But I sort of realised then I've got to... If going to the top of the village is giving you palpitations and making you feel like you're going to pass out, you really need to get over this. But um, And so it spiralled from then. I, I've, I've grown up um, with what I am my doctor told me is generalized anxiety disorder and it got to the point where that mixed with agoraphobia you know fear of social situations and I never left the house and when you're in that when you never leave the house everything you do outside of the house is the most terrifying thing so I had to deal with that and I didn't start to deal with that properly until I was probably 25 26 27 um I, and it, not until after my mom Bless her, she passed away of a, a spontaneous brain bleed. So um, that was horrific. And it wasn't until after that that I started to, to, to deal with my own problems. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. But what I wanted to do while I mentioned generalised anxiety disorder, which is what I still suffer from now, is get a little description of that. From I pulled it off of the NHS website. And there's a little uh, thingy for it. It's called GAD. Um... GAD is a long-term condition that causes you to feel anxious about a wide range of situations and issues rather than one specific event. Uh, people with GAD feel anxious most days and often struggle to remember the last time they felt relaxed. As soon as one anxious thought is resolved, others may appear about a different issue. GAD can cause both psychological, mental and physical symptoms and they vary from person to person but can include feeling restless or worried, having trouble concentrating or sleeping and dizziness and heart palpitations and there's a link to um, many more symptoms. Um, with my, my GAD, uh, generalised anxiety disorder, I have the most long-term stomach problems <laughs> that I can um, imagine. It is... Um, GERD now, what it's led to, which which is, do you know when you get acid and sort of irritable bowel and, and horrific reflux problems, that is it's long term that, basically, very long term, um, I think it's gastroesophageal reflux disease, and that's come from being anxious for so long that it has just affected my stomach uh, on a on a daily basis, and um, and, and anxiety will give you reflux problems, uh, acid coming up to the throats, um, indigestion, bowel problems, which is irritable bowel, uh, palpitations. You'll get, you'll be, if you have anxiety, you'll probably have palpitations more often than you don't have palpitations. Sweating, headaches, migraines are, are bad um, with me. Um, shaking, muscle weakness, just everything, everything possible. You will get that if you've got anxiety. Um, more so in the middle of a panic attack. In the middle of a panic attack, you will feel like you're dying. And, and I'm not joking. That's not an exaggeration. Your mind is telling you that something horrific is going to happen. And um, for a lot of people, that will be, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to have a heart attack. Or, you know, something horrific is going to happen to me and I've got to run away. Or sort of act. I've got to act. And that's flight or fight. But um, panic attacks and generalised anxiety, they're, they're quite different. A, a panic attack is in the moment. It just sort of hits you like this from God knows what. Anything can bring them on. Whereas sort of anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis is just a general level of it. It's a little bit more easy to cope with than a panic attack. But as I say, with that, with generalised anxiety, you are going to get these physical symptoms more often. People who just have panic attacks might only feel those horrible things for for that short amount of time and a little bit after. But if you do suffer with, with sort of chronic anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a lot of physical problems that come with, with the mental side. So hopefully that little bit of rambling 
will uh oh but sorry i forgot to mention there are many other forms of anxiety not just uh, generalized anxiety most people have agoraphobia which is like social anxiety that they're a little bit different um i think agoraphobia might be of places um whereas social anxiety is of, of any of um being around people i might have got that wrong but i know they're slightly different there's health anxiety um hypochondria which is what i also suffer with I've got a little bit of all the anxiety uh, disorders. Um, then there's there's sort of many other things, and then you're going into territories like bipolar, uh, which are all various forms of depression, and, and can have anxiety issues with them. Um, and, and anxiety and depression they tend to go hand in hand. It does get very depressing that you are anxious all the time, or randomly in the middle of the night have a panic attack. It gets very depressing. <laughs> so I'll, I think I'll do a, a depression video a little bit later as a separate one because as I say it is an entirely different thing even though they are linked I'm just going to get a drink right so I'm hoping that might have I don't know whether that will have cleared up what it is but that's what anxiety is for me um, generalised and just sort of going about your day to day life feeling like um, everything that you do has a risk. Do you know what I mean? Even for me, it was putting in put food in the microwave. We had a microwave blow up. So then everything after that, every every electrical item after that became a terrifying risk touching it. I, it was deep. My anxiety was ab extraordinary. Uh, how I managed to live with this for so long was uh, is beyond me. But I was scared to um, fry food my mum set fire to the kitchen once and that stuck and with most people you, that, things like that will stick at a normal sort of risk level like okay so if i don't do what she did which was throw a, a, a frying pan that's on fire into the sink then i'll be okay but no i took that as, as even even going near the frying pan was dangerous and then with the microwave blowing up i was terrified of that everything just and things outside the house i was scared to talk to people in case i got mugged <laughs> like that happens every time you leave the house um, and, and everything that I did became a risk so I did nothing I sat in the house and I got worried and then because I wasn't doing anything I started to internalise anxiety into my body like I would always find something to be scared of uh, I would listen to my own heartbeat all the time to make sure it, the rhythm's okay I would check for lumps uh, so often and obviously when you look for something, you, you are going to find something eventually. But obviously, luckily with me, things always turned out okay. But this this is the vicious cycle. And that was what anxiety was, well, it still can be now. So um, why do we get it? I've wrote down um, to talk about. Uh, this is a, a sort of multi-layered question. And I, I just wanted to touch upon that in the video. Uh, it's different for everybody why um, you get anxiety. Some people like me might have had some really bad childhood trauma that might bring it on. Other people with anxiety, like my mum, um, will obviously make you a little bit anxious. My birth mother, now, she has schizophrenia and she never brought me up. I was brought up by my grandparents and, and my birth mother wanted me to call them mum and dad. So obviously in this video, if I mention my mum, it's my grandma. And if I mention my birth mother, it's my birth mother. Just for the sake of, of clarification. She had schizophrenia and I was scared sort of seeing the side effects from that. And there's many, many different aspects of my childhood which, which made me an anxious person. I'm not blaming them. You can't sort of blame other people for your own things. But it led from that. Having an anxious person around you makes you anxious. And and I followed her because she was my, my mum. And... It led from that but other people might with anxiety could have had a perfectly sort of calm relaxing childhood and still be an overly anxious person it depends what your trigger is a lot of the time there is a trigger sometimes it's alcohol abuse drug abuse say childhood problems bullying being bullied anything like that um i know one lady who had it from getting the flu after she had a very bad case of the flu she had she got anxiety I don't know why, it's just one of those things. I suppose you could say 
um, an event. Life stuff. Being alive makes you anxious. It can give you anxiety. I think that's probably the best way to um, to explain that. Um, but other than that, uh, I don't know. I, I don't think anybody does. And I think that lately it has become more of a normal thing to have anxiety than it used to. When you used to talk about this type of thing before, it was very much a disorder do you know what I mean? And not just, I mean, it still is, but the word disorder or mental illness was um, thought of in an entirely different way than it is starting to now. We're normalising it. And in that, I think it may, it does make people realise that these things, they are normal. You don't go through your entire life feeling sort of on the mid-level happy, just plodding along happy as anything, you are going to have ups and you're going to have downs and sometimes they are going to be extraordinary. They're going to be horrible. You could be feeling so depressed or anxious that you don't know what you're doing with your life. Do you know what I mean? And then you could go from that to having just a period of just wonderful happiness. It is normal. You react to stimulus around you and this is how and this is why we get this stuff. Um, I reacted to my family situation so people will react to uh, bullying or other traumas, things like that. Car crashes could do it. Going in the army, I've had a few people contact me that have been in the army in Afghanistan and have struggled with extraordinary anxiety after that. They're reacting to stimulus. Um, yeah, it is normal. I know that it will feel like it isn't at the time, especially if you're in a situation where you're the only person with it and everybody else around you is sort of plodding along and dealing with the same situation that you are but in a more relaxed way you will feel like you're not normal and that's wrong because you are it's just i mean if you see the way i react to situations <laughs> you know what i mean you will feel great about yourself when my mum passed i coped really well because in my head my anxiety had made me wonder about these situations about 50 times over so when it happened, um, I, I felt like I'd already gone through it so often. I knew exactly what to do and I, and I, I was calm and obviously I was, I was heartbroken, but I coped. I really coped really well and everybody in the family always says they were surprised at this given what they know about me. But uh, I can then have an absolute panic attack and, and breakdown about the tiniest thing in my house. <laughs> like a day-to-day -day thing that most people would shrug off. I can have a breakdown over that but I coped with the death very well. I don't know. I don't know why. It is part of it, I think, uh, my anxiety. Um, but there, so work that one out. I'm gonna have another drink now. So there, and now um, after that, why we get it? Short answer, we're human. We feel human things. Sometimes it's long running, sometimes it isn't. Um, and I wrote down now to talk about treatment. So um, this is going to be quite a big one. Whether I'll split this into two videos, I don't know. But treatment for anxiety and probably depression as well is different for everyone. There is no um, cut and dry cure for feeling these types of things. And it is because it is a human emotion, what you're feeling. Um, there's no cure for those. You can't get rid of feeling anxious. You can't get rid of feeling sad or depressed or manic uh, but you can treat it and when I was I'm trying to think if I, I think it was about 14 when I when I mum finally started to notice that it was um throwing me off I left school I um, finished school at 14 and I had a tutor because I couldn't cope she took me to the doctors and my doctor said he looked at my mum and he said she's got anxiety and he gave me a box of citalopram and that was it, he sent me home. We had no more sort of treatment for it and I and I started to take them. And it, it worked a little in the way that my sort of general sort of anxiety level, which is always here, it was here. But what it didn't do was give me any reason why I felt like this. And um, it didn't stop the cycle. It trekked the cycle. And sometimes that is very, very helpful, especially if this has been sort of a long time un untreated. But with me, 
I then went for the next couple of years just like that, just still exactly the same person that I am, but with less anxiety. And, but in general, uh, citalopram is quite is very effective. There's some others which I've tried, sertraline, that's similar to citalopram in how it works. You'll be given that a lot if you struggle with postnatal depression, things or after, you know what I mean, after having a baby it's given. Um, I think it's something to do with breastfeeding that I can't remember why, I but I had it after, after I had Lara, I was given sertraline then because I struggled with postnatal depression for a little bit uh, and it worked very well, very well. The only downside to some um, antidepressants like citalopram and sertraline and um, fluoxetine, which I'll talk about in a second, is that they upset your tummy a little bit and with me having my issues with my stomach, it upset me to the point where if I went in the car I would throw up. So it was a very unpleasant few years from about 14 um, till I started experimenting with other ones, other antidepressants in about 1920. Uh, really, really, really upset. So you sort of, you're getting help with one problem and it, it gave me another one. Uh, but yeah, I, I went like that till I was 19, just sort of going about the same existence of being in the house. But because I felt a little bit better, it was it was more pleasant than it had been than I, before being treated. But what I really needed was help, and I needed to understand a little bit more about why I was anxious and and what was going on in my brain. So when I got to nineteen, I just got so fed up of being in the house all the time. I went back and I told him, "Look, they're working, but I need more help." And at that, it was then that he um, told me about a type of therapy called cognitive behavioural therapy. And this is what you're more than likely to be offered today instead of just sort of um, seeing a therapist, you know, to, to talk about your problems and your past and, and all these types of things, which is very much a sort of talking and going through uh, your problems therapy. Um, I'm trying to think of the word, I've lost it now. But yeah, that is more, yeah, talking about things. Whereas cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, is a self-help therapy, really. You're gonna act, it is an active therapy. Um, what it does is your therapist will sort of show you the cycle that you're going through when you're anxious. And you. everybody is, everybody with anxiety has a cycle. And, she, and your therapist, you'll have to ignore my cat scratch, by the way. I tickled her tummy, she didn't like it. But there's a cycle in anxiety and it is consistent and every little thing that you do will either take away from it or make it worse for it. and those those little things that you do how you react to anxiety it's sort of how it starts and it goes through the thoughts that you have the feelings that you have and the way you react to those feelings they make up this cycle of anxiety and she'll go through that with you and then you, she will go through your the way you react to it is very personal Sorry about that, I hadn't turned to the door. But yeah, now the cycle. Now I pulled up a little sheet so I can, can help me describe it to you. Um, the cycle of anxiety and it is a vicious one. Now it starts off with your anxiety. You get nervous about something and then it says here, you get increased scanning for danger, physical symptoms intensify, your attention narrows and shifts sort of to yourself. So then the next step would be, so if you felt that, if you felt all these things sort of after anxiety, like what is going on? Do you know what I mean? Um, you get, you feel sick, you are, your heart's racing, and then it'll come with many other different things. You'll be looking around for what this sort of danger is. You might know what it is. It might be like, I don't want to go out the house. I'm scared to go out the house. Something's going to happen. And then once you've done that, you will look for an escape or an avoidance, won't you? You, you react to that stimulus that you've just given. And, um, that's flight or fight, that, that response. Um, most people will, you could have a run away from the situation that you're in when you're feeling this anxiety or you avoid it altogether. So if I was starting to feel like I don't wanna go out, I'm scared to go out, but I've got to, then I will find an excuse not to do it. And in the short term, that will give you relief. You'll feel like, right, okay, so how I've reacted to this has made me feel better. Therefore, it is a good thing when it's not true. 
avoiding them or, or stopping doing something that makes you anxious will only give you short-term relief. It's a band-aid, um, really. But in the long term, you have just confirmed to yourself that this situation has, it, there is direct harm from this situation. You have said to yourself, right, every time I escape, I feel better. And that, and you've just gave yourself a long-term plan to do that. And that is, is a very, very, very bad thing to do because you confirm into yourself your fears. Even though nothing happened, you've confirmed that because not doing it has made you feel better. And not and feeling better is a good thing, right? Um, but no, it's very, very short term. It, it's sort of like, say you've got a, you're addicted to cigarettes and you're stopping smoking and it's making you feel horrific. And it does. <laughs> But then you feel, right, you know what would make me feel better is if I had a fag right now, a cigarette. And then you do it and you get this instant relief and you feel better. But obviously that is not helpful in the long term, is it? And and that's sort of a similar thing. And the way you react to your initial anxiety is called a safety behaviour. For example, one of my safety behaviours would be, say, I don't want to go out. Okay, I won't then. That's a safety behaviour. They can come in in different forms, sort of like, when I did go out when I was younger, when I used to sort of force myself to, to go outside, I would always have a bottle of water with me because when I'm anxious, I get nervous, my throat hurts and all these things. And so I would always, always get a bottle of water or buy one from a shop. And that would be my first thing that I would do every time. And to me, this felt like it was helping me um, go out. But if I didn't have that bottle of water, I would freak out like really freak out and I wouldn't be able to continue. I wouldn't be able to say go to the library or something because I didn't have my bottle of water. That became a safety behavior. It became a crutch. And again, that is feeding your anxiety and that will make you more anxious in the long run if you don't have your crutch. So the whole idea behind cognitive therapy is that you do these things without a crutch. And it's hard, it's really hard. I started my CBT at 19. I had six months of bi-weekly sessions, I think, or it might have been once every fortnight. I can't remember which. But anyway, I had about six months of these. And even though it helped me to understand the way my brain was working, this whole sort of threat cycle, I wasn't prepared to treat myself by uh, sort of baby stepping, which it was outside of the house. I wasn't prepared to talk to people. And the fact that she told me that, that this was the only sort of treatment, I was like, I can't do it. Do you know what I mean? And, and even though I went through the six months telling her I would do all these things, I didn't do it. I failed. And then the year after, I, I started it again. And the year after that, I started it again. And that, and that, and that. And I did this every year trying to say, come on, we're going to do it this time. I just couldn't do it. Because in reality, what she was saying to me is I had to do the one thing that made me anxious. Well, the 20 things that made me anxious, but you get the idea. And that's a hard thing for your very anxious brain to hear that you have to do that. And it was too hard for me at the time and I failed every time. And so I sort of told her, CBT doesn't work. When in reality, I wasn't working. The therapy there was helpful. I wasn't ready for it. Um, and it wasn't until I was... I think 27, a, a year or so after my mum died, that my cognitive therapy finally worked. I um, went in and, and sort of did it again, but I was so defeated by all the years of failing and, and watching my mum pass, having been so anxious that she only really lived for pleasing other people. Like in the house, she was a housewife, so she lived sort of pleasing my dad. And that was her entire life. And she was too scared to sort of go out and do other things. And she never did. And it, it played at me that because I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to be a slave to my anxiety. And mine was worse than hers. Um, and I, I realised if I don't do something now, that might be what happens to me. So I went in there with a little bit more sort of oomph than, than I had before. Um, with a bit more confidence so when it started and what, what she told me to do, and this is the same thing that she told me many times, it is baby stepping. She sort of write down a list of things that make you nervous and then you write down your thoughts about them. So not going outside. My thoughts, if I go outside, something bad will happen to me. 
And then she will challenge that thought with a different thought, a more rational thought. And you have to think of these. And mine was, if I go outside, chances are nothing is going to happen to me. But it could. It could. And part of anxiety and what makes people so anxious is that they don't have control over these situations. I don't have control over what happens to me outside. I don't have control over what happens to my body. The only thing that I can do is say to myself, look, there are a couple of very positive things that I can do to help this. I can avoid going down down in a narrow street in the middle of the night carrying golds and riches. And then I won't get then I won't get robbed. Or I can sort of lower the risk of getting robbed. I can um always wear my seatbelt in the car. I can check my body monthly for lumps and bumps and, and anything. For my health, I can eat right, I can exercise, and that's the only control I have over life. And that's hard. And and her telling me this it was very, very hard to wrap my head around. But it is very helpful when you can do it and when you can start realising that you can live a happy life without having control over these situations. But you can't sort of put all of the... You can't rely entirely on yourself to be able to um, go through your life avoiding all negative sort of um, effects. You cannot stop yourself from getting cancer. You can't stop yourself 100% from going outside and something happened to you that is embarrassing. You can't stop yourself from getting mugged. You don't have that kind of power and that is not your responsibility. And when you think of it in that way, rather than, oh, I'm a failure, I can't control my own life, it, it's a little bit more helpful. But it takes a long time. It takes a long time. It's baby steps is, is what you're going to do if you take on a cognitive behavioural therapy. And, and the physical side is that you will do a little bit of what scares you. You'll go outside a little bit, take a little walk, and then you'll write down how that made you feel. And you'll do it again. And you'll push yourself a little bit more, a little bit more, and a little bit more each time until that sort of act becomes boring to you. You've done it so many times that it's not nerve-wracking anymore. But it takes a long time to get to that point. And when you go outside those first few times, if that's what scares you, you will be covered in sweat, you'll be anxious, you'll feel horrible and you'll feel horrible for weeks. And your mind, this little sort of anxiety demon in the side of your head will be saying, no, stop it. We don't have to do that. It's making us feel bad. Therefore, it's bad for us. Let's stop. Let's just go back to our little nest and, and never do it. And your first few sessions of CBT, you might do that. You might fail like I did. But you have to keep trying, you really do. Because when you come through the other side, like like I have now, and I can, I can talk to people, I'm doing this, um, it's very freeing. And it's not a cure, you will never be cured of it, I don't think, but you will feel a bit better. And you'll be able to um, control these sort of spinning cycles of anxiety in your brain a little bit better, which is, is really what you need to be doing. You need to to gain control of your thoughts and not let them control you. And just because you're anxious of something doesn't mean you can't do it. And just because you're anxious of something doesn't mean it's going to happen. You are not psychic. And one of the symptoms of anxiety is, is catastrophizing every situation that you go in. You think black and white, either it's not going to happen or the worst thing is going to happen. There's no sort of, when I go outside, I might trip up. There's, I might go outside, something horrifically bad is going to happen to me. And it happens in, in every area of anxiety that uh, catastrophizing is one of the one of the big symptoms. It's one of your sort of mind processes. Mine, what, which is a big one, which I call the what if syndrome, is my biggest one. I will go, I will, my mind will like throw out these, what if this happens, what if that, what if this, what if that, what if that. And this goes on and on and on and on. And you start to believe them even though they are ridiculous. That's one of my, and that is a big symptom of generalised anxiety disorder. Many people do it. Most people just shrug them off. But um, CBT will help you learn how to cope with those, those, those thoughts if you're struggling to do that on your own. It's sort of like sort of decoding your brain to me is how I always des describe it. And there's going to be a lot of writing in diaries and about how you think, and she'll give you tools to counteract each negative thought that you're having she'll give you another another thought and it's very very helpful sometimes you might find it not helpful enough on its own so mixing it with an antidepressant that you that you've found works for you 
might be the winning solution for you. It could turn out that, in fact, you do need the other type of therapy, sort of more of a talking um, therapy to talk about your problems and, and the things that you've gone through in your life. You might find that helpful as well if if those are things that are you haven't had any closure on. Um, and you could do that with a therapist, you could do that with a friend or a family member, anyone. Just whatever feels right for you with that. There is no wrong mixture. I think the more angles that you attack this, the better, to be honest. And this is one of mine, right, in this video. This is how I'm sort of coping with my sudden influx of anxiety at the minute, is by, by doing this video. Because I think when I'm looking at myself right now, talking about it, it's sort of accepting, yes, it's it's a little bit high at the minute, and it's happening, but, eh, we've done it before. So there. Um... Some of the other medications I've been on, just in case anybody was uh, curious, are uh, I've had, I've had a couple like amitriptyline, which is which is a different type of um, medication. It, it's sort of a sedative, so I took it at night and it made me drowsy, which really did help with my sleep. So I take it and then half an hour later I'd be like, Ugh. <laughs> so sleep's one of your problems. That's really good, and it did help with my chronic neck condition, which I got from being. So you, you've probably noticed a few times through my video I do this. And that's because I'm anxious. So the shoulder comes up to protect my neck. <laughs> and that over the space of years has given me a very chronic, very painful neck condition. And so the amitriptyline helped with that as well. It, it's some kind of sort of muscle relaxant. It was helpful, but it gave me so much sort of drowsiness that it started to affect me in my day-to-day -day life. So it's not a long-term problem unless your pain and your anxiety is that crippling that you don't care about feeling groggy. That was a good one. I really didn't and, and, um, like amitriptyline. And I've been on a few more like that with sedatives in, but some of them are a little bit too strong. Um, I can't remember what it was called. Trazodone, I think, um, that, that gave me so, so much drowsiness. My mum had to push me up the stairs when it kicked in. It's like, go on, you're nearly there. So obviously that didn't work for me, but it does for some people. And it's all about what works for you. You'll go through this with your doctor, different trials and different medications. There is no right or wrong um, set for you. The last one I went on was fluoxetine, which I think is Prozac. And I went on this for the shortest amount of time that I've ever been on any medications. And I went on this for five, six months. And I had a fantastic run with it. This was um, after my postnatal anxiety problems, about a year after Laura was, my daughter was a, te uh, a teenager, a toddler. It's the same thing, really. But, uh, and it, I struggled with it because you're even more isolated when you've got a toddler. And so I, I went on this for six months and I, it, my mind is out there all the time. Like I'm scanning every situation. I can remember people's faces after five years that I've seen in the street because that's how much I scan every sort of environment. And when I was on when I was on this, fluoxetine, I didn't do that as much. It pulled my focus back in a little bit, which helped me dramatically. The only downside to it was that it, it is really bad for irritating the stomach. So if you have got stomach problems, they probably will put you on something like lansoprasol for your stomach. Um, I had to come off it eventually because my stomach gets so bad. Like I said, I'm I'm travel sick going on a swing with, with medications with my stomach. Um, but as far as my anxiety goes, it was it did a fantastic job. So if anybody's struggling, haven't tried it yet, just ask your doctor about it. That that might help you. And you'll and and there's many more. I've been on lots, lots at the minute. I'm not on any medication after fluoxetine. I came off that. And you have to do this very gradually. Always withdraw from your medication the way your doctor tells you to. Because if you stop taking it, and I did this once, you will feel horrific. It's horrible. You will Your anxiety will be 20 times worse. But the physical symptoms, sort of, they're called brain zaps. Which is just like your head feels like you're going... Like that every now and again. You get things like this. And it's scary. Usually, mostly harmless, I think. But it feels horrible. So it's always best to withdraw the way your doctor says, over a pace of, space of months, not days, months and months and months. That's a little thing. So yeah. Um, I think I'm about done for the rambling and I might, I might go into 
each section separately if anybody if there's any interest in this or they want me to go into something a little in a little bit more depth and more structured then I'll post follow-up videos but all I wanted to say is that it is okay not to be okay you're gonna heard that lots by now because it's all over social media but it's okay people aren't expecting you to be happy all the time and if they are they're not great people because they're not happy all the time just because they don't have anxiety or even depression doesn't mean they are going around perfect and that they're coping with life better than you um it's just different some people feel more than others and that's all and i do i'm extraordinarily um is the word empathetic empathic i don't know I, I, anybody's sad or an animal is sad and I am distraught and I think that's where my anxiety and depression come from. Feeling strong emotions like that for a long period of time is, is good, it's, but it's, it's tiring. It really is. Uh, and I think that's where it comes from. It is normal. There is no sort of, it's not a millennial thing, like people keep saying. Like I said, my mum, who was 60, struggled with this till, since she was probably in her 20s, maybe even earlier than that, but it was undiagnosed and a lot of them were undiagnosed because people didn't really want to talk about it. You don't want to tell people that kind of thing. You don't want to tell people back then you've got a mental illness. <gasps> Do you know what I mean? It's not new. And I think that now more than ever people are going to want to talk about this and you'll find that if you ha if you need to talk to somebody about this they're going to be a lot more open than you think they might even turn around and say yeah me too um i'm glad you've brought it up but never feel like you're alone and your anxiety i always think of it as a little 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 demon in my head trying to sort of separate me from people and and um to stop me from being happy it's like a little cloud it's going to make you feel like you're on your own and you're not, but it needs you to be, because it can't feed off you if you've got people around you. It can't get what it wants from you, um, make you feel depressed or anxious if there's people around you supporting you, and it will make you feel like there aren't, and there are, there really are. And if you don't have anybody in your direct life to talk to, go to your doctor, straight to your doctor. There are many, many, many ways to get support now. Um, go online have you got if you've got an online support group I had one for a long time an anxiety support group and that's what really opened me up there were 10,000 people in it 10,000 people some of them with little weird things happening weirder than mine my fear of the microwave some people had stranger things than that <laughs> do you know what I mean and, and when you're in the group like that sometimes you can laugh about it which is which is pretty good you're never on your own um even though you might feel like it and when you feel like that for a long time you're going to get depressed and and my next video I'm going to talk about depression and it might be a little bit different tone to this one because depression at the minute is I think I'm noticing it a lot more in people than I did um especially men I, I even me I didn't notice men suffered with this kind of thing I always thought it was a woman thing because of the way we are with emotions but no it turns out that they've just not been talking about it and they need to. We all need to talk about depression. The risk of suicide and suicide rates at the minute are so high and you notice it so much more, don't you, that people um, committing suicide that we really need to talk about this kind of stuff. This It's not something you are going through alone. Same with anxiety. We're all going through it and we're all trying to handle it the way we can um, in our own different ways. Me, I'm overly smiley and overly chatty. And it's just it's just the way I deal with it. Some people are sullen and, and they, they don't want to talk to people. And, and it's different for each person. But you have got to reach out if you need help. Learn about it. Go online. Learn about what it is that's bothering you. Sometimes I find, like with cognitive behavioural therapy, when I learned what was happening clinically in my own head, that helped. Um, so you might find that that helps finding out a little bit more about the medical and clinical side of your your illnesses might just sort of make you realise, hang on, this is not me. It's not really me. I'm not really like this. And I can be a different way. Um, so if, if you find this video helpful in any way, just give me a, a comment or a, a message and let me know 
or if there's any part of this that you want me to go through more structured so you don't have to listen to me rambling for what I think is 45 minutes then let me know but I hope you guys have a good day and I'll be back soon for another one thanks for watching guys bye